Welcome to part 5 of topic 3 in Materials Engineering Mate 210. In this part we'd like to talk about crystallinity in polymers and ceramics specifically and also come up with a way to calculate the density of a material based on its crystalline structure to bring us back to the original application of density. It turns out that polymers, which again are these long chains of zigzagging atoms going back and forth, can form crystals as well as metals. But the problem is that they're, because their molecules are so long, they can't form perfect crystals. So instead, what happens is you end up with a semi, typically a semi-crystalline structure that looks something like this. Regions where the molecules are lined up as crystals, zigzagging back and forth through the crystal, where the unit cell would look much like this picture for the unit cell of polyethylene on the left, and then regions of amorphous material between the crystals. So we have crystallites, they're called crystallites, which are, have the molecules lined up, and amorphous regions in between. So when I say that the material is semi-crystalline, I don't mean that it's kind of crystalline. What I mean is that part of the material is crystalline and part of it is amorphous or not crystalline. Most crystalline polymers are actually semi-crystalline. And the amount of crystallinity can vary from as low as 5% up to a maximum of about 70%. And most materials, most polymers that is, have percent crystallinities around 30 percent. How about ceramic materials? Do they have crystal structures? The answer is yes, almost always. The exception to um, the materials that don't have crystal structures that are ceramic are known as glasses. Any material that's ceramic but does not have a crystal structure is called a glass. Even materials that you can't see through at all. But we're interested in the crystalline structures of some of the cer metal, um, ceramic materials that we commonly find. So we have crystal structures like the halite structure or the metal oxide structure, where I have an anion next to a cation next to an anion, and so on and so on and so on. The classic example of a metal oxide is sodium chloride, which is where the name halite, which is Greek for salt, comes from. Another crystal structure is cesium chloride which exists for both cesium chloride and a number of other famous ceramic materials. In this crystal structure, the chloride occupies the corner atoms and the cesium occupies the base centered structure. There's also the zinc blend structure, which is much more complicated and you can see is made up of one element in the center, in the center of tetrahedral sites between these other four elements here, the red elements. There's also fluorite, which is made up of a metal atom and two oxygen atoms, or MO2. There's perovskite. An example of perovskite is barium titanate. Barium titanate is a special material because it has a piezoelectric effect. If I compress this crystal, it distorts the, the dipoles between the atoms and creates an electrical charge. That's how piezoelectric crystals work. And then there's the quartz crystal, which is also the same crystal used for diamond, silicon, and silicon carbide, where you have SiO2, silicon and O2, forming these tetrahedral structures, where you have silicon in the center and oxygen around the outside. The resulting structure looks something like this. If this were diamond, all these atoms would be carbon. So let's go back to density. Is it possible to figure out the density of a material from the unit cell? The answer is yes, by using this equation. The density is equal to the sum of all the atoms from the first atom to the kth atom for the number of atoms per unit cell, n, for that atom type, i, times the atomic mass of that atom type, i, divided by the volume of the unit cell, v sub c, times Avogadro's number, where Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole. So if I plug in these numbers, I should get a density very similar to what I get in real life. We'll practice this.